new members or potential new members or visitors? <coughs> No. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a really special guest speaker. Sorry. Um, no, no so we're going to do that. You're kind of our business coach. We're moving on to the final part, which is our guest speaker. Uh, so my report, as usual, is in the style of the usual patterns and not saying much in several paragraphs. What I want to do tonight, right off the bat, though, is finish off the awards that we gave out at the AGM. There's a three few members that uh, we need awards to that weren't able to, to uh, be in the AGM. And at least a couple of you here tonight, so we're going to uh, finish off the awards from uh, the AGM. So the first one will be Chuck Abdullah. Uh, oh. So, for his outstanding support and engagement in the world of telescope, how do you Everybody knows Chuck, he's up on the hill every night. He was crazy. So, Chuck is actually tireless. He's up there every night with his telescope, and he's absolutely amazing to listen to. Uh, if you want the public, he has minds of people at his telescope, and the public just loves listening to this guy. And he does it time after time, so, uh, high time to be there. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, that's a heck of a place that uh, is very thoughtful of you to, uh, to do this. So thanks. Great kind of you, Tim. As you know, well, with appreciation, I should be giving up one because as the other people know this, they're sharing their telescopes up there. Uh, you know, we get the benefit of it. But it's a real enjoyment for us, too. And thanks also to people that are helping me with my telescope now. As the older we get, the heavier it gets. And Roy and Roy has been the one that helped me and others, too. So thanks. Thank you, Chuck. And for exactly the same reason, Roy Watson. So once again, it's absolutely tireless in his uh, attendance, especially up on the field other areas and in our club as well. But uh, yet another person at the club that just loves listening to it and tirelessly shares his time. Uh, Saturday after Saturday. So we'll present you with the same morning. Thank you. 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 This is an absolutely amazing job, so we'll have to give this to him separate. And so the big one, Malcolm already knows it, and he's won this award. He actually met with him before the AGN, giving this little plaque that he gets to keep um, for the rest of his life. But we also have the main plaque that Bruno has, which has his name on it, and you get to keep that one for a year, and we're going to ask for that one back about next September, so we can give it to next year for the year. Hang on to that, and we also have the official certificate for you. So, as you don't know, Malcolm has been like 20, over 20 years with this club, and he's done so many different things. Um, facilitating events uh, during International Astronomy, uh, Astro Astronomy Cafe. Uh, he's done at least two stints as the newsletter editor, and done a great job on both of those. And just sort of been a real style of, of, of our club for. Well, over 20 years anyways, and so we thought it was high time to recognize Malcolm. So we've already done the presentation with little one, but we'll make it official tonight with the big plaque. So come on out, Malcolm. <laughs> so this is the one you get to keep for a year. You can hang it on your wall or gaze fondly at it. Oh. <laughs> right there. And we'll get this back. For next year's one. And also, this pack you get to keep as well. All right, so David, we'll give it a little bit of a picture. 
Can you get that on there? And so thank you for everything you've done over the years. It's just amazing that you hung in there all this time and have done this stuff. And um, probably you should have done this a long time ago, but uh, it made the memory. There you go. <laughs> I'm very honored. Thank you very much. Alrighty, so Bruce will need to report. Sorry, now after some dinner expenses, our member account stands at $11,068 and our gaming account at $20. But we probably get in touch with Sid very soon to figure out how to do this whole raffle business since I've taken that on because I know any better. <laughs> <laughs> the next uh, Rascals at the Cattle Point will be on January 15th. We have a 6 30 start just so you can get a chance to throw some chow down before we run out there. Hopefully, this one time, we'll actually get some clear skies. It's got to be a good thing, buddy. <laughs> so that's where we're at right now. That's where you get some check. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Bruce. Now, we have an outgoing secretary and our new incoming secretary. The next report joins the other people who will report from. She heard everything over to my group. And it's all done. That's all done. Okay, so that's. You know, uh, I thank Joey for turning everything over to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, October monthly minutes are, are posted on the website. Oh. Yeah, yeah Michelle is public so you're taking coffee right now, so uh, I think he's not. Um, no, I'm, I'm doing the coffee. Are you doing the coffee today? So I would be leaving a little bit earlier. Um, Do we know where Michelle is? He's on the boat. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> so we, we talked a couple of days ago, so I'll be opening the library. Okay, and for those of you. Uh, those of you who don't know, after we finished uh, the meeting tonight, our guest speaker, everyone's welcome to go up to the Astronomy Lounge on the fourth floor in Elliott Building for coffee, cookies, and just general chit chat. Uh, whether you remember or not, you can all come up. Uh, yes. Okay, so membership stands at 220. Um, there are about a dozen people on the grace period membership list. Uh, these memberships have expired either at the end of October or at the end of November. So if some of that group will leave at the end of this month, so I'm figuring we're probably around 212 kind of in real members, uh, kind of continuing members. Um, the other thing I'm going to uh, show members is uh, RAC Vancouver has, a, has gotten a jacket uh, with a logo on it. Yeah. So I, uh, I decided to get one. They, they actually brought them over to RGA but I uh, um, didn't make too much of a presentation about it. But it uh, seems to be quite a nice jacket. I haven't done a lot with it yet. But what is nice is the inner jacket uh, converts to either long sleeve or vest. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like the one sleeve so I can get it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it seems to be really, really quite warm. It's, um, it's kind of a water repellent. And they've got a nice little one of those jackets on the logo. And if you want to pay more, you can have a big logo on the back, too. Um, it doesn't seem to link to their home page. So if you are interested, it seems to be best to search for RASC Vancouver Jack. And if you search for those three things, you should be able to find yeah, it. Yeah, I tried it. It works. So the, all of the centers from BC are shown? Yeah, so it's the five centers of BC are each noted by a star and the names around the outside of the world. No, 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 no. Yes, yeah, so we're there. <laughs> I know, I know that it's waterproof, but what makes it warm? Well, this is insulated too. If you want to come and have a look at it, see, and there's the, well, a couple of layers in this, but it's, it's mostly in this. It was doing quite well at the BCO a couple of Saturdays ago. It was getting a bit chilly, but it wasn't too bad. And there's room if you buy a big enough one for a sweater. <laughs> okay, Red. So I'm going to get over to our council. Um, not to step down from the uh, newsletter. Uh, Red Dunphy is our new uh, Spanish editor. And he refers 
First of all, I'd like to thank Malcolm for all of his uh, efforts. You've done it at least twice, uh, two sessions at, at uh, the Sky News. And what I have here is an award winning issue of Sky News. Maybe, maybe I should rephrase that. This is an issue of Sky News that celebrates award winners. Maybe that sounds a little bit less boastful. And I started off with we've got a gorgeous picture of the Whirlpool Nebula, or, or Galaxy rather, on the front page. This is a the uh, prize-winning uh, photo done by Dan Posey. Inside, there's a uh, a nice photo of uh, the 2015 Newton Ball Award recipient Malcolm Springer uh, conducting um, uh, public outreach, and uh, he's talking to the Queen there actually. <laughs> and uh, we also have um, a uh, kind of a scoop, we scoop Space News uh, and uh, Space.com about a, uh, an encounter with a Japanese satellite, High Brahma, over Venus. And uh, this is the second chance that uh, the satellite had to land on Venus, and through a tremendous amount of ingenuity and tenacity, um, they were able successfully to um, put this uh, space probe around Venus. And we just had confirmation this morning that they were successful. So we know about it in there. <laughs> and so I have nine copies of this. I, I don't know how many people ever come, but this is an experiment. So the first nine people who come and approach me can get a copy of it. <laughs> and I will say the picture here is very nice. It's suitable for framing. And, and, uh, and we would make a covenant Christmas present for all. Thank you, guys. For those of you who don't know, the Sky News magazine is also available on our website. Uh, you can go to the website and read it online or download it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've written on the Sky Party with them, it's pretty sad. Um, so not much to report there. And we're still looking for someone to coordinate our public outreach programs. Help facilitate that four or five um, sort of major projects <laughs> here, here. Since um, Sid has tirelessly been closed for so many years and has finally stepped down um, in some of the kids' sites and um, organized this four or five sort of major events in here. Um, so if you're interested, come see us. Uh, but Sid is still doing the school program, so do you have anything to ask for that? Uh, it has been very busy. Of fall, shall we say, we have been out for 26 times giving talks. I've been night sky view. Thanks to all the volunteers who came for a night sky view. We have a perfect <coughs> uh, viewing. Thanks to Chris, <coughs> Ken, and everyone else. Alex, whoever he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a great time. We have been busy because of the, the schools can't take their kids to the CU anymore, so we are asking us to come and help them out. Yeah. So it has been good <coughs> in the spring. Yeah. So it's good, it's going strong. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks, sir. Lori, <coughs> do we know what's going on with the DAO next year? Are we going to be taking a lead on that? Or? Um, hi, um, we are presently in negotiation with um, with the NRC, um, with the friends of the DAO uh, that may take over the the um, what's, what's the word? Um, they may take over the administration of of that. But at this point, we're we're still. We're still trying to negotiate ourselves around that, and it may be that next year, next this coming this coming summer, that we do the same thing as we did last summer. Is that in fact the RASC that is the main negotiator, and the FDA will be the following year. It just it, there's still a little bit of something going on, but yes, I mean we still will be doing something, and they still want us to do something, and we can still be open on the side of the night, and we'll still be doing all of that. 
I don't want to. I don't want to say that's not going to happen because it will. It's just, it, it, there's just a little bit of, of you know who's going to be taking reins and, and what's going to be going on. Yeah, but we're still in the middle of all of that with uh, Todd Donnelly and and uh, everybody at the DA. I would have to get the DA. Can you let us know as soon as possible because we need to get going on that month January. If you guys can't do it, we need to start working on it real quick. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's all. <coughs> yeah. It'll. It'll. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like this, uh, um, all the stuff that's going in for the FDA, all of it combines what we did with the RESC, so that all the RESC stuff is kind of going in at the kind of at the same time. I, I think it doesn't mean any sense to you, but. It will, it will happen, and it's uh, yeah. It's just it's just under whose on, under whose reign, and it actually depends on whether or not the FDAO gets enough money, you know, to be able to do this. If we don't get enough money, if we don't get the funding and the and the, the grants that we want. Then we won't. We FDAO will not be able to take that on as a as a as thing, and therefore our ASC will will do that. <laughs> Uh, but yes, we will let you know as soon as we find out <coughs> what is going on. Yeah. Okay. Do you want it sooner? We have to make a decision within the next um, month. I'll give you a call. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, website, Joe. When are starting to do it again? The website is ticking on very well. Um, I put in a little observing report for the lunar eclipse. We finally got around to doing that. And the, uh, of course, the album of all the photographs that people took. We have the lunar eclipse in September. is all online as well, so have a good look around. Uh, there's a couple of visual surprises on our photo hosting site. If you look at the recent astrophotos, you'll see a couple from um, Charles Banville, and most people here will know he's a, a fairly skilled photographer, so go and have a look. Thanks. Good thing. Yeah, technically. I'll just follow up on the website stuff. We had uh, 1,500 visitors in the last uh, 30 days or so, each spending about a minute and a half on the site, which is pretty good. Um, for stuff tech committee related, uh, no fixes or anything going on at the uh, VCO, but we did buy a light pollution filter just this last month, and it arrived very, very quickly. Uh, I don't think we've put it to use just yet, but it's currently in the box for the QSI. If anyone wants to use it, it just screws in. Uh, yeah. Yep. Actually, Dan's used it. Yeah. Oh, he did? Okay. Well, good stuff. What brand is it? Dumcon? It's IDAS. Is, is it it's the like good ones. Is it the latest generation? Yes. Is it the latest generation? Yes. Okay. Right. Good. Anything else? Just that. Okay. Good. Just that. Uh, anybody have anything else to uh, bring up at the meeting? <coughs> okay. I have calendars up here. Uh, if you had already. Um, um, put your name down to get one and did not get one at the annual dinner. Uh, please come and see me. I have your name here. I do have probably about another eight or nine that have not been spoken for. So first come, first serve. They're quite lovely. And um, so please come at the $15 fee. Okay, I think else? Sorry, <coughs> um, national business. Uh, there's not really anything new to report. Nothing special? Not, not at this point. No. So, if there's nothing else from anybody else for the business portion, then let's get to the really fun stuff. Um, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Alan Batten. I mean, most of us know him from years and years up on the hill. Yeah. Um, Dr. Batten was at the Dominion Astrophysical, Astrophysical Observatory for over 50 years. Among other positions, he has been uh, president of the Victoria Center of the RFC, national president and honorary president, as well as the editor of the, uh, of the National Journal. 
Now has been the Vice President of the International Astronomical Union and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. His field of research is in close binary stars. In retirement, now has been a decade visiting astronomers in developing countries on behalf of the IAU and now publishes on the history of astronomy. So tonight's talk will be about when did modern astronomy begin. So please welcome Dr. Alan Bowden. Modern astronomy hasn't begun yet. Thank you. 
I'll try to talk without the microphone. If people can hear me on the top shelf. Yeah, that's it. Raise your hand if you can't hear me. <laughs> I much prefer to talk without uh, the microphone if I can. Uh, being a professional scientist, I have a healthy distrust of modern technology. <laughs> Just look how long it took us to get this. Uh, so when did modern astronomy begin? Uh, I think we um, can make a very good claim that astronomy is the oldest of the sciences. Uh, we all know about Greek astronomy, ancient classical Greek astronomy, but the Greeks learned from the Egyptians and the Babylonians before them. And the Chinese have records going back a long, long time, and we're still using Chinese records to, uh, uh, to study comets and supernovae. And although it's less well known in the West, there was an active Indian astronomy in ancient times that preceded the Greek astronomy. So astronomy is a very old science indeed, but much of that ancient astronomy was motivated by astrological concerns. So I don't think we can call it modern astronomy. And so I ask myself the question, when did modern astronomy begin? And I think that uh, if I asked each of you individually, I would probably get a number of possible answers. So let's look at uh, some of the answers that you might give. I think one of the first that many of you would give is 1543, when Nicholas Copernicus published his uh, famous book, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium. And this was the uh, first uh, uh, suggestion in the West, in the modern West, that the Sun and not the Earth was the center of the solar system. For Copernicus, uh, that meant the Sun was the center of the universe, which of course we wouldn't agree with now. Uh, and indeed, Copernicus had predecessors. Uh, Aristarchus of Samos in ancient Greece uh, had suggested a, a heliocentric system, and Uriabata in Italy <coughs> had also done so. But in, uh, in modern uh, Western culture, Copernicus was the first. And so that's obviously a landmark uh, of the beginning of modern astronomy. But there are other possible dates. And only a few years ago, we were all getting excited about the International Year of Astronomy. Uh, and uh, that was the 400th anniversary of Galileo turning the telescope to the skies. And uh, so discovering the phases of Venus, the satellites of Jupiter, and uh, that the, the um, uh, Milky Way was composed of myriads of stars. And so that's also an important date. 1609 is an important date for another reason, which perhaps uh, uh, you've overlooked in the excitement that uh, a few years ago, over the anniversary of Galileo's telescope. And in the same year, Kepler published the Astronomia Nova, uh, which uh, contained his first two laws of planetary motion. That the planets move in ellipses around the sun, with the sun in one focus of the ellipse, and that uh, the line joining the sun and the planet sweeps out each areas in equal times. And this was indeed a great landmark. It was actually a much better proof 
of the heliocentric system than any of the arguments that Galileo uh, put forward. And it's one of an interesting sidelights in the history of astronomy. Why did Galileo ignore Kepler? Kepler sent him a copy of his book. They, they corresponded frequently. There's no evidence that Galileo ever read that book. And subsequent history might have well been different if he had uh, taken the trouble to read something that his friend and colleague had sent him. Uh, I must confess to being guilty of done, having done the same thing myself. <laughs> you know, you know, colleagues send you preprints. In my days, there were preprints. Nowadays, of course, they're all on the web. But uh, in my days, there were preprints that were sent out. And there have been more than, there's been more than one occasion when I've ignored a preprint uh, because I was so busy in my own work. And if I'd read the preprint, I might have done a little bit better than, in fact, I did. And I think that's something of what happened to Galileo. But there's also another uh, aspect of that. Galileo couldn't free himself from the notion, going back to Plato and Aristotle, that uh, the planets must move in circular orbits. Uh, and Kepler had discovered that they, back, in fact, moved in elliptical orbits. <coughs> For Galileo, and that was something he couldn't quite understand. Well, there are other possible dates. I think this is one that a few of you might think of, but it's important in its way. Giovanni Domenico Cassini, an Italian astronomer who actually lived most of his life in France. <coughs> he was the first director of the Paris Observatory. And uh, he uh, determined the first modern value for the distance of the sun. And this, of course, is, is very important for uh, uh, our understanding of the nature of the sun. It, it's uh, absolutely essential if we're going to uh, even begin to try to estimate the amount of energy that the sun is pouring out into space. We have to know how far away it was, or it is. And uh, Cassini managed to determine this, and he relied on Kepler's work for doing this. Because Kepler's third law, which came, uh, as you see on the screen in front of you, came ten years later than the other two laws. The third law is the one that relates the distance of a planet from the sun to its period around the sun. And it enables us to build up a scale model of the solar system. And we can measure the distance between any two bodies uh, any two planetary bodies, not satellites, of course, any two planetary bodies yeah. in the system, if once we've measured one distance, we can determine all the rest. What Cassini actually did was to measure the distance of Mars uh, from the Earth. And this was sufficient for him to be able to determine the distance of the Sun from the Earth. And uh, it's not an easy job to do. Uh, you have to take into account uh, that uh, what you have to do is to uh, measure the position of Mars early in the evening and late in the morning. And uh, then you can determine the parallax of Mars uh, and, uh, com uh, compared with the radius or the diameter of the Earth. And you've got to allow, of course, for the motion of Mars during the night We've got to allow for the fact that um, uh, at, at each observation you are observing Mars low in the sky when atmospheric refraction is important. And um, so the fact that Cassini came up with a value within 10% of the modern value is a, is a tribute to uh, his abilities as both an observer and a theoretician. Now, there's one other date that you might think of, and that, of course, is the publication of Newton's Principia. Uh, I've given you the full title there, but we always refer to it simply as the Principia. And uh, Newton showed in the Principia that the elliptical orbits of planets that Kepler had discovered and the fall of a stone to the Earth 
could each be explained by the inverse square law of gravity. Now, there's no doubt that all these states are quite significant. Uh, modern astronomy could not have developed without uh, any of these uh, discoveries having been made. Uh, and you can make a good case for any one of them being the beginning of modern astronomy. But that being said, they did not in fact make very much difference to what astronomers could do. Uh, Galileo's telescope was very important, but uh, it was also imperfect. It was good enough to show him the craters on the moon, the phases of Venus, and the satellites of Jupiter. It wasn't good enough to show him the rings of Saturn. He knew there was something unusual about Saturn, but he couldn't say what it was. And uh, so all that astronomers could go on doing was what they've been doing for a long time, and perhaps a little bit more accurately, measuring the positions of stars, the position of the planets as they moved amongst the stars. They could begin to look at the surfaces of the moon in particular, and of the other planets. Uh, they could uh, begin to discover nebulae that uh, previously had been totally invisible to the naked eye. But they couldn't do very much more than that. And uh, this was, as I say, because of the imperfection of the telescopes they had. You've all seen pictures of telescopes like this that were very common in the late 17th, early 18th century. Now just look at it. Uh, uh, an objective lens way up there uh, and an eyepiece down here and a very flexible connection between them. Uh, I think it must have been extremely difficult to find the image that the objective had formed uh, in, uh, in its focal plane to find it with your eyepiece. And a slight gust of wind would have been enough to uh, disturb everything. Uh, I think if I'd been required uh, in my working days uh, to use a telescope like that on top of a little Spanish mountain, I would have decided that astronomy was not the career for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> why did they build long telescopes like this? Well, most of you know the answer. Uh, lenses do not form perfect images. Uh, they have chromatic aberration. The colors, different colors of light are focused at slightly different points. And they have spherical aberration. Uh, a spherical lens does not, or, or a lens is composed of spherical surfaces, portions of spherical surfaces, uh, does not bring light to a unique focus. And the result is a blurred, uh, multicolored image. And uh, so, uh, during much of the uh, 18th, uh, 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century, uh, telescopes were very important uh, instruments, but you could minimize these problems by having telescopes of a very long focal length. And uh, that's why you see this, this rather cumbersome apparatus that we have on uh, show there. So, you might say to yourself, why not use reflectors after all? Uh, those of you who have telescopes, I, I wouldn't mind betting that there's no one here with a refractor, you all use reflectors. reflectors. Why don't you use reflectors? First of all, they were invented in the 17th century, independently by the Englishman Newton and the Scotsman Gregory. Now, I went to school in England, and I was taught that uh, Newton and Gregory invented the reflecting telescope at much the same time, but Newton was first. <laughs> and then I went as an undergraduate to a Scottish university, <laughs> in fact, the very university in which uh, James Gregory was the first professor of mathematics. I was taught 
that Newton and Gregory invented the tele reflecting telescope at about the same time, but Gregory was the first. <laughs> so uh, the moral of that is, don't believe everything you're taught at school or at university, or even at lectures at the Victoria Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society. <laughs> okay, reflectors were available in the late 17th century. Why didn't people use them? No dramatic aberration. Spherical aberration was eliminated, eliminated, eliminated by using a paraboloidal mirror. Mirrors made of speculum metal, which was an alloy, if I remember rightly, of tin and copper, <coughs> quickly tarnished, lost their vigour, and I believe uh, in extreme cases could actually crack. So uh, uh, that made them rather awkward to use. And silver on glass mirrors were not invented <coughs> until the middle of the 19th century. But of course, nowadays we don't put silver on the glass, we put aluminium on the glass. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the principle appeared in, in the middle of the 19th century. So, uh, during most of the 18th century, astronomers did not use reflecting telescopes. They did the best they could uh, with these uh, rather long, cumbersome, long focal length instruments. The exception, of course, was Sir William Herschel. Uh, and during his lifetime, he probably was the greatest astronomer in the world. There's no uh, getting away from that. And uh, he was uh, uh, he is famous, of course, for his discovery of Uranus. He was the first person to have discovered a planet, the first person we can name who and uh, discovered the planet because all the others were naked eye objects and easily seen and whoever first recognized them uh, is now lost in the mists of antiquity. So he's famous for that, but that was probably the least important thing that he did for astronomy. Uh, he was the, the first person to try to estimate the size and structure of what we would now call the galaxy. He even suggested there might be some objects outside the galaxy. He was right about some of them and wrong about some of the others. He was also the first person to uh, prove that there were uh, double stars that were physically connected, that uh, two stars were revolving around their common center of mass. And uh, from that, of course, stems all our ability to measure the masses and luminosities uh, and uh, radii of stars. And it's a rather complex story, which I don't intend to go into tonight, but that was basic to much of our knowledge, <coughs> uh, our modern knowledge of the properties of stars. <coughs> and uh, these last two discoveries of uh, the, the structure of the galaxy and the um, existence of double stars or binary stars, he was actually the person who coined the phrase binary star. Uh, these were both discoveries of the 19th century, the early 19th century. Herschel was a sort of transition figure between the old astronomy and the new, and we owe a tremendous amount uh, to his insight. Well, uh, as you probably know, he began his career as a musician. Uh, I have at home a, a CD, which I play from time to time, of uh, organ music composed by Herschel and played by an astronomer who is also uh, an organist, an astronomer at the uh, Observatoire de Verdun outside Paris. And he played a number of, uh, of Herschel's organ compositions uh, on the organ of the parish church of Meudon. But uh, <coughs> after, he did, after Herschel had discovered Uranus, as you know, he uh, got a pension from King George III, the much maligned King George III, 
he lost the American colonies, but he supported William Herschel, and that was probably more important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so uh, after that, Herschel started um, building very big telescopes. He'd already begun to build telescopes for himself, and he went against the trend of uh, 18th century astronomers. He built reflectors because they were easier to build. And uh, when the king gave him a pension and he could spend all his time on astronomy, he started building bigger and bigger telescopes. First of all, he built a 20-foot telescope. Now, I have to explain that in uh, the 18th century, it was common to refer to a telescope by its focal length rather than its aperture. The 20-foot telescope had an aperture of about 18 inches. And he, uh, that was very successful. And it so inspired him that he decided to go uh, to double it and to build a 40-foot telescope. And you've all seen pictures of this. Uh, and uh, the 40-foot, of course, was the focal length. The aperture was about 48 inches just about the same as the smaller of our two telescopes uh, up at the DAO. And uh, there you are, there's this famous picture of Herschel's 40-foot telescope. And it could be rotated, you see the whole thing was on a great turn turntable, and he could raise it in azimuth as much as he liked, so it was a wonderful uh, azimuth mountain. mountain. Uh, but it was awfully cumbersome. He was building a head of the technology of his time, uh, and uh, he needed two assistants to turn the telescope. And in fact, the telescope was rather disappointing. Uh, not a great deal came out of it, and Herschel gave up using it uh, and um, uh, went back to the 20 foot telescope. But we go on from William Herschel to his son, John Herschel who was one of the leading scientists of 19th century Britain. You see, he was born just before the 19th century began. And uh, he uh, continued his father's work, in, uh, principally by sending him to the Southern Hemisphere. The reason I'm putting him in uh, here, however, is to remind you that he was one of the pioneers of the development of photography. And the development of photography was of capital importance to modern astronomy. Now, nowadays, uh, most of my colleagues uh, are rather scornful about the photographic plane, and because we've got modern uh, detectors, CCDs, and so on and so forth, that have indeed many great advantages over the old photographic plane. Uh, but if the photographic plate had never been developed, uh, modern astronomy would not have emerged. Uh, many of you remember my good friend and late colleague Murray Fletcher, and he and I had uh, a little running joke with each other that one day uh, professional astronomers will rediscover the advantages of the photographic plate. <laughs> But of course, they wouldn't be able to call it a photographic plate because that would sound far too old fashioned. So they'll call it a, a wet process solid state detector. <laughs> <laughs> but now, let's go from Herschel to his near contemporary, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Wessel. And Wessel was one of the most important astronomers of the early 19th century. And uh, he was the first man successfully to measure the distance of a fixed star. And I'll come to that in a few minutes. But what I want to draw your attention to now is his rather strict definition of what astronomy is. Here's a man who was active in the early part of the 19th century and this is what he says about astronomy, that uh, the business of precise measurements, <laughs> of positions and orbits, and everything else that one may learn about the objects. For example, their appearance and the constitution of their surfaces 
This is not unworthy of attention, but it's not the proper concern of astronomy. Now, do you realize that means that neither I nor any of my former colleagues at the DAO uh, are astronomers? <laughs> uh, well, maybe on second thoughts, uh, I would get by because I did at least study orbits. But my good friends and colleagues who are working in cosmology, they, they just don't cut it at all. <laughs> uh, that's a very restrictive definition of what astronomy is, but it's what astronomy was in the early 19th century. And uh, here is another man, uh, a little younger than uh, Bessel. He's a particular hero of mine, uh, but uh, he would have uh, probably largely agreed with what Bessel said. And like Bessel, he was one of uh, he was one of the early people who successfully measured the distance of this of a fixed star. There was a bit of a competition between them, which would be first, and Struve very nearly won it. And uh, I'd love to stand up here and tell you that Struve really did. But um, objectivity compels me to admit that Bessel uh, got there first. But it's no coincidence that both Bessel and Struber used instruments designed and made by this man. Now, most of you probably know the name of Fraunhofer uh, in the context of the Fraunhofer lines, uh, the absorption lines that cut across the spectra of the sun and the stars. Uh, but he was a superb craftsman, a superb optician. And one of the things that had been happening in the late part of the 18th century was that uh, opticians had discovered that by combining uh, in the objective lens two lens, two or more lenses of different kinds of glass, you could greatly reduce, almost eliminate, the effects of chromatic aberration. And so refracting telescopes began to look more attractive again. And I have to admit that one of the things that uh, led opticians to this discovery was the need on both sides during the Napoleonic Wars for good portable telescopes. And reflectors obviously wouldn't have been very useful right, in the situation of looking across at the enemy, line, enemy lines. The refractors were much more convenient. And astronomy, uh, astronomy profited from the developments in optical technology that were stimulated by war. Just as uh, in the Second World War, the uh, demands for radar uh, stimulated the growth and uh, development of radio astronomy. It's something we don't altogether like to talk about, but uh, astronomers have profited from wartime developments. So Fraunhofer uh, made very good telescopes, and this is the one that Struber used. This is the drawback refractor. Dorpat was the name of the town where Struber lived and worked. It's in Estonia. It was, it was a Germanic name that was used at that time in modern days. Now that Estonia is at last independent, it's called Tartu. And uh, this is uh, the very telescope that uh, Struber used, and it still exists. I have been in that room, and I looked at that telescope quite closely. It's a beautiful uh, work of craftsmanship. Uh, unfortunately, I understand the objective lens is, uh, is um, damaged and we can't now see uh, through that telescope as Struber saw through it. He actually, when um, it was first, um, uh, first arrived in Dorpat, it was set up in that room and he used it in that room. A little later, it was put up in a, a, what he called a rotatory cupola, <laughs> otherwise known as a dome. Uh, uh, but uh, now there's a modern telescope in that dome, and uh, that's back uh, as a museum piece 
uh, in the room as Struva first used it. Uh, and um, it's, uh, as I say, a beautiful uh, example of uh, both the opticians and the mechanics craftsmanship. It was, I think, the first uh, telescope, to, professional telescope to be equatorially mounted, and um, the first to have a clock drive, and uh, Struve used it to uh, study uh, binary stars, but also uh, to measure the parallax of Vega, and uh, as I say, he nearly beat Bessel to the, to, uh, the successful measurement of stellar parallax, but he didn't quite make it. So uh, uh, that then uh, brings us to the question of uh, the observation of stellar parallax. And uh, in the years from 1838 to 1840, three people uh, independently and almost simultaneously uh, managed to measure the distance of a fixed star. Uh, Bessel measured the distance of the, or the parallax of the components of 61 Cygni. Struber measured the parallax of Vega. And uh, Thomas Henderson, a Scottish astronomer, and I can't show a portrait of him because no known portrait of him exists, uh, observing from Cape Town determined the distance of Alpha Centauri. Now, none of them are quite right according to modern values, but they all were able to convince their colleagues that yes, they had successfully measured uh, a distance. And this was important because other people had tried to do that throughout the 18th century, but somehow they not carried conviction. And uh, James Bradley, the third astronomer royal, had tried very hard uh, to measure uh, a stellar parallax about a century before these three determinations. But um, he, he had said, if the star has a parallax of one second of arc, I could have detected it. Uh, and, uh, and so astronomers knew what they were looking for, how, how, how carefully they would have to measure in order to determine the distance. And as you now know, uh, the nearest known star, Alpha Centauri, has a, a parallax of only three quarters of a second of arc. So Bradley was very close, but uh, he didn't quite get there. And these three people together uh, managed to, um, uh, to do it almost at the same time. And contemporaries judge, I think correctly, that Bessel got there first. And so Bessel was given the, royal, the, the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1841 for his successful measurement of the parallax of 61 Cygni. And this, of course, just as I said a little earlier, the, um, the determining the distance of the sun was essential uh, for the development of uh, modern theories about the, uh, the nature and the energy, uh, the nature of the sun and the energy that is radiating into space so determination of the distance of fixed stars was uh, essential to uh, any of the developments of modern astronomy. Uh, I rather like this uh, quotation from John Herschel, who was president of the RAS at the time, and it's the tradition in the Royal Astronomical Society that the president presents the gold medal and gives an account of why the gold medal was presented uh, why the work was considered significant. Now, the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society is, I think, just about as prestigious, prestigious as a Nobel Prize. It doesn't carry any monetary value with it. But uh, I think that any professional astronomer who uh, was told that he could award the gold medal of the RAS uh, would feel very pleased with himself at all. Uh, and I, I love this. Uh, rather high-flown account by Sir John Herschel. Uh, I'm not going to read it all. For one reason, if I read that word in passing, uh, I grew up in a country 
where uh, the words impassable and impossible sound quite different. But on this continent, you never quite know which one you mean. <laughs> Most of you, I think, would say, if you wanted to say impossible, what I would call impossible, would say something like impossible. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but you know, I think uh, there's a lot in this paragraph. Perhaps I ought not to speak so strongly, because he knew that many astronomers had tried and nearly succeeded, and then they'd be disappointed. But he confesses himself unequal to such prudence. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, it's the greatest, most glorious triumph that practical astronomy has ever witnessed. And I think that's still true. Uh, the measurement of the distance of big stars is so fundamental to everything that has followed. I think it's still true to say that that is the, the, the uh, greatest and most glorious triumph of practical astronomy. And uh, the only thing, the only thing that was wrong with that, he said, uh, let us hope that as the barrier has begun to yield, it will speedily be effectually prostrated. And unfortunately, it wasn't. Even at the end of the 19th century, there were only uh, 20 or 30 stellar parallaxes known. It wasn't until they could apply photography to the measurement of stellar parallax that uh, we really did begin to get to know. Uh, what the distances of the stars were. Uh, <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned earlier, Sir John Herschel was um, <coughs> one of the pioneers of the development of photography. Now this brings us to Sir George Airy, the astronomer royal during much of the 19th century. He's had a rather bad press, partly because of his uh, uh, a supposed negative role in the discovery of Neptune, uh, and that is uh, rather more controversial than we used to believe, uh, partly because of his personal characteristics. I don't think he would have been an easy man to work for. And he was very, very meticulous. It has been said that when he uh, uh, wiped his pen with a piece of blotting paper, he filed the piece of blotting paper. <laughs> now, I have worked in the Airy archives, and uh, I have to admit that is an exaggeration, but it's a pardonable exaggeration. But the reason that I have put Sir George Airy on, or one of the reasons I put Sir George Airy on here, is his um, account of his visit to Pulkova, the observatory founded by my hero, a built up Struber. And um, when he got home, he wrote a long article in English. I don't think Mary knew any other language. He wrote a long article in English to the editor of the German periodical Astronomische Nachrichten, uh, uh, giving his views of uh, the observatory of Pulkova, which were largely favorable. I said he wasn't a very easy man to work for. I don't at least I suspect he wasn't a very easy man to work for. But amongst uh, the uh, people he thought of as equals, uh, he showed a quite different side. And Struva and Airy were good friends. Indeed, Struva's son continued the friendship after uh, Wilhelm Struva's death. Uh, but uh, there was something, nevertheless, uh, a lack of warmth about Airy. Once or twice, uh, Struber would uh, start a letter to Harry Toyster Freud, i.e., my dearest friend. And always the answer came back from Harry, my dear sir. Uh -huh. Struber didn't try that very often. Uh, but anyway, here is Harry uh, talking about uh, the observatory of Pulkva. And the part I want to draw your attention to is. Uh, Airy's comment on the fact that the observatory of Pulkova was not only concerned uh, with astronomical observation, uh, a very important part of its work was the, the geodetic measurement of the 
uh, of the Russian Empire. Strudler, of course, knew what he was doing. Uh, he knew that uh, measuring the figure and size and figure of the Earth was essential to getting uh, a really good measurement of the solar distance, which was essential to getting a really good measurement of stellar distances. But he also knew how to sell to Tsar the fact that uh, well, I, I can survey the, em the empire for you, and this will be a great practical use for you, provided you let me build an observatory and spend an awful lot of money on good astronomical instruments that I can use to do all sorts of interesting things. But uh, Harry uh, picks this up. And just look at this. It is, in my opinion, exceedingly important. As well, Robert, uh, for preventing astronomers from wasting their time in the mere fanciful abstractions of science. As for giving to the observatory its proper place in the public estimation, that it should be in part devoted to some distinctly useful purpose of this kind. And of course, Greenwich, as you will know, was uh, devoted to the determination of uh, latitude at sea and the provision of a time service. And so, in the same way, Pokemon was partly devoted to measuring the, um, the Russian Empire, surveying the Russian Empire. Neither Struber nor Airy made the distinction we make between basic and applied science. They took it for granted that it was their job to do both. Uh, but uh, you see, again, an echo of Bessel's uh, restrictive definition of astronomy and Aries talking about uh, astronomers wasting their time in the mere fanciful abstractions of science. I don't think Airy would have approved of speculations about the first three minutes of the universe. <laughs> well now, we've come to uh, a figure who's not an astronomer at all, uh, who gets a rather bad press from astronomers, Auguste Comte, a philosopher, founder of a philosophy called positivism, and uh, not one of the first rank of, of philosophers, but very influential in his lifetime, and indeed well into the 20th century. And uh, Comte, argue that uh, men and human beings could never uh, discover the chemical composition or the physical structure of the stars. And uh, I'm afraid that a number of my colleagues uh, make fun of Comte because of this statement. Uh, and indeed, some of them are unwise enough to make fun of <coughs> philosophers in general and say, well, if that's philosophy, just look how wrong it is. Uh, and of course, as we know, uh, shortly after Comte's death, death um, we discovered the way in which to learn about the chemical and physical structure of the stars. But uh, the point I want to make here in showing then is that the best astronomers at the time would have agreed with him. Bessel and Airy would have agreed. Uh, and Bessel would have said, well, even if we could determine the chemical composition of the stars, that's not the business of astronomers. Uh, well, we're a little bit unfair to Kant, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, Gustav Kirchhoff, of course, was the man who, uh, a decade or so after Kant's death, uh, with the help of his colleague Robert Woodson uh, showed that, in fact, uh, the Fraunhofer lines in the spectra of, sun, of the sun and stars, to which I referred earlier, give us the clue to determining uh, the chemical composition, at least of the atmospheres of the stars. And um, as we found uh, early in the 20th century, it can, can combine that, not only the chemical composition, because that comes in a rather complex way from the strength of the brown of the lines, but also the physical structure of the atmospheres. 
But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. And I want to come back to the building of bigger and better telescopes. And here is uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross. He was an Irish peer, as you can see, uh, very much a child of the 19th century. And he was an amateur astronomer. And he wanted to, uh, to build a really big telescope. And you've all seen pictures like this. This is the Leviathan of Parsons Town, a telescope of 72 inches aperture, i.e. just the size of uh, our bigger telescope up on Little Sandish Mountain. And uh, here it is, uh, unfortunately it's no longer uh, in operation, but uh, it has been partially reconstructed. There you see a picture of it. <clears throat> you can see from the nature of the building around it, it couldn't move very far from the meridian. Unlike uh, Herschel's 40-foot telescope, which was on an out azimuth mount, but like Herschel's telescope, it was ahead of its time, technologically speaking. Uh, the mirror was still made of speculum metal, not uh, silver or glass. It couldn't be moved very much. And it turned out, like Herschel's 40-foot telescope, to be something of a disappointment. Uh, partly because uh, of the climate of Ireland. And Ireland is not called the Emerald Isle for nothing. <laughs> I see you all know why it's called the Emerald Isle. And, uh, but it made one great discovery, and that was made by Lord Ross himself. This is the first record of the spiral structure of another galaxy. Most of you, I think, know M51, you call it the World <coughs> Nebula. I suspect many of you have taken photographs of it yourself. There's a modern photograph, just so you can compare the two. Uh, they, the orientation is a little bit different. But, uh, I think you can see that Lord Ross was a pretty good draftsman. Much better than I am, and I suspect most of my colleagues. This was the, the beginning of extragalactic astronomy. Uh, it wasn't recognized as that at the time. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, before he got into philosophy, wrote a book called The, uh, the General History of Nature with the Theory of the Heavens. And uh, there's an awful lot of waffle in it, actually. But in the waffle, there were two ideas that have stuck. One of them was that there might be other systems of stars outside our galaxy our Milky Way. And the other was a very rough, qualitative description of how the planets uh, might have originated uh, uh, from a, a cloud surrounding the sun when it was first formed. And um, in fact, uh, that theory, much modified and uh, made more rigorous, is still the accepted theory of the origin of planetary systems. When people first saw these spiral nebulae, some of them jumped on one bandwagon and said, oh, these are the other galaxies that Kant talked about. And others uh, stood on, uh, jumped on another bandwagon and said, oh no, this is the way, this, these are planetary systems in formation, just as Kant described. I suppose if Kant had still been alive, he would have been very happy because either way he won. <laughs> but uh, this is in fact uh, uh, Lord Ross's sketch is the beginning of our modern extra cosmology and uh, uh, extra galactic astronomy and cosmology. But not everyone accepted this. Here's Simon Newcomb. Born in Canada, by the way, although he lived all his life 
in the States and considered himself an American. Uh, as late as 1906, uh, Newcomb uh, said, we, we still, we will never know whether there are other galaxies or not. And, uh, no, we all have the can't, because if we will never be able to determine the physical structure of the stars, and we say, oh, that's so much for philosophy. Here's one of our own, one of our greats. And he was supreme in just precisely the areas of astronomy uh, that Bessel uh, indicated uh, uh, was astronomy. And he made exactly the same uh, wrong, well, not exactly the same, exactly similar wrong prediction. And uh, 20 years after he died, uh, Hubble uh, sh showed definitively that um, the spiral nebulae were other galaxies. We laugh at Comte, but <clears throat> since Newcomb is one of our own, we conveniently forget that he made such a silly prediction. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> one last look at 19th century telescopes was the great Melbourne telescope, again a 48 inch telescope, and you can begin to see that uh, it has something like a modern equatorial mountain. It was more fortunate than the other two big telescopes I looked at. Uh, it continued uh, in a modified existence right up until the fire, the disastrous forest fire that destroyed, destroyed the Australian National Observatory in Canberra. And there's a group of people now trying to reassemble uh, the various parts and to reconstruct the Great Melbourne Telescope in Melbourne, Australia. But despite these attempts at large reflectors in the 19th century, many people still referred, preferred to practice. Here we have Otto Wilhelm Struve, the son of Wilhelm, uh, the grandfather of the Otto Struve uh, who came to America and was in the early part of the 20th century was one of the leading astronomers of uh, the US. Uh, he uh, wanted to build a big telescope for Pulkova. When his father founded Pulkova, it had a 15-inch refractor, which was the largest refractor in existence at the time. And uh, Struber decided uh, that he had, it was his job to restore Pulkova to that kind of eminence. And he actually built, or arranged to have built, a 30-inch refractor, uh, and he traveled to the States to uh, meet the Clark brothers, uh, and uh, uh, it was the Clark brothers who built the Pulkova refractor. Like uh, other big instruments, it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, Otto's son, Hermann, used it in uh, classic studies of the satellites of Saturn, but apart from that, it didn't do very much, and it was completely destroyed in the Second World War. Uh, Otto Struve was uh, often criticized for not being interested in astrophysics, which was just beginning uh, uh, towards the end of his life to be an important part of astronomy, despite what Bessel said. Uh, the criticism is not entirely fair, but no doubt his heart was in the old fashioned position of astronomy. But uh, the Italian astronomy, a Jesuit astronomer, Angelo Secchi, uh, is of course well known for his studies of the spectra of stars and for recognizing that there are different types of uh, stellar spectra, which uh, are, uh, is uh, again an essential part of our modern studies of uh, stellar structure and evolution. And a little later, about the same time, uh, the British amateur astronomer, Sir William Huggins, built his own observatory and uh, uh, financed it entirely himself, began to apply photography to spectroscopy, and he was aided very much by his wife, uh, not to take them on the bad hair day, I think. <laughs> and, uh, uh, 
Some people say that Margaret was the brains behind the, uh, uh, the couple. I'm not sure that's true. I think they were probably equal partners. Uh, Barbara Becker has recently um, written uh, a biography of this couple called Unraveling Starlight. I haven't read the biography, but I did hear uh, uh, Barbara Becker talking about it at the AAS meeting in Seattle uh, not quite a year ago. And on the basis of her talk, I uh, no hesitation whatever in recommending the book to you. And it's perhaps interesting to end uh, with the contribution of, uh, of a woman to uh, the development of modern astronomy. Uh, you're only Royal <coughs> the Royal Astronomical Society, the one in London, not uh, our own. Uh, it was founded in 1820 and it had a royal charter from King William IV. And uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, they decided that there was, here was Margaret Huggins doing first class work in astronomy. There was Agnes Clark, uh, not doing so much research, but uh, as you all know, it was a first class popularizer of the astronomy of the day. And, um, they didn't quite know what to do uh, about uh, women who were working in astronomy. True, right at the beginning of, of the RAS, there was Caroline Herschel, and they made her an honor, honorary member. <coughs> so they made Agnes Clark and Lady uh, Huggins honorary members. And they tried to uh, uh, get through uh, uh, a notion that uh, more than one hour of general meeting that women could be elected properly to the society. And there was some opposition. <coughs> Part of it was, all right, it was male chauvinism. Part of it was, well, in those days, you couldn't call a lady a fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it was a genuine fear that the original royal charter under William IV since it hadn't envisaged the possibility of women being involved in astronomy, uh, it, uh, uh, it didn't mention them, and uh, you couldn't elect uh, women without violating the Royal Charter. So in 1915, uh, they, the RAS bit the bullet, and it went to the then King George V and asked for a new charter, uh, which explicitly stated that women could be elected as fellows of the Royal Astronomical Society. Now, I may seem to have strayed a little bit from my theme, when did modern astronomy begin? What I've tried to uh, uh, put across is that uh, <coughs> in the 19th century, many things happened that uh, transformed the nature of astronomy and led us to the, uh, the beginning of astrophysics and the beginning of cosmology. Uh, the developments in instruments, in telescopes, that made so much of uh, modern astronomy possible. Now, the big reflectors of Herschel and, uh, and Ross and Melbourne, though they weren't entirely successful themselves, they were essential experiments in producing the big reflectors that we have today and the even greater ones that are on the drawing board now. The development of photography was quite essential to the, uh, uh, to the rise of modern astronomy. The successful determination of stellar parallax was above all the one thing that made modern astrophysics possible. And so even this question of gender equality, we pride ourselves now uh, on uh, our, um, that we are the generation that uh, recognizes uh, gender equality. But women were fighting for and achieving equality with men in the study of astronomy before any one of us in this room was born. Thank you. I'm going to
questions for Dr. Dunn? Yeah. Uh, Fernhofer telescope you showed in a room, and you you said that it was being used for observations from inside. So mm -hmm. it through an open window? Oh, oh of course they have a window, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Struve was uh, a, a bit like a small boy with a new toy. Uh, and when the telescope arrived, uh, the, the, he was very excited and uh, he couldn't wait to put it together, despite the fact that Fraunhofer had forgotten to uh, send the instructions for putting it together. <laughs> uh, but uh, he managed, and uh, yes, of course, he opened the window. And I think, uh, if I remember rightly, the first, one of the first things he observed was Saturn. Uh, I and mean, all this was splendid. What, what a wonderful image it was. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they were still building the, uh, as, he's, as I say, he called it the rotatory cupola. Uh, as soon as it was built, they put it up there. Uh, uh, there was the, the telescope came in several crates all the way from Munich, where it was built, up to Dorpat in Estonia. And uh, at the Estonian border, it was met by an army officer. You know, you did these things properly in those days. And apparently the army officer uh, uh, and had some accident as he was uh, transporting it and broke a leg. And, uh, and a little later, when Struva had it up in the dome, uh, he got to, he stumbled over it in the dark and he broke a leg. <laughs> and he said, well, that's why we call it the Great Refractor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, what was the difference in timing between when you said uh, Fessel uh, did that the first um, uh, parallax of the star um, and Mr. Uh, the uh, It was published in 1938. And, uh, so what was it, what, was it just months different or between him and... Well, uh, uh, it's a very complex story. Um, <coughs> Struve uh, measured the parallax of Vega and published that also in 1838. But he himself said, probable error is too large. Uh, this is only a provisional estimate. Uh, then Vessel came with 61 Sydney. And uh, then Struber published a um, revised model for Vega. Uh, and um, uh, with a much lower probable error, and he said, this is it. Actually, the <coughs> first estimate was closer uh, to the modern value than his revised estimate. Uh, and then Henderson thought, well, if those two have done it, I, I have all these observations of the Cape that I haven't bothered to reduce. Maybe I can do it. And, and uh, so Henderson did it, and he published last of the three. Um, in the days of Stalinism, there was um, a, a Soviet historian of science, Sokolovsky, who was uh, determined to show, of course, the Russians did it first. And it is true that although he was born in uh, uh, what is now Germany, he was then Denmark, lived most of his life in, in uh, the Russian Empire. Uh, so, Sokolovska had to prove that Struve had it first. And, and uh, she went back to his first determination, which was, uh, as I say, actually closer to the modern value. I'd say, well, that proves it. Uh, then the second office group, the American office group, uh, wrote an article at the time in Sky Intelligence. Uh, and he said, they wrote one of the brightest memories bequeathed to me by my family uh, it was the great friendship between uh, my great grandfather, i.e. Wilhelm Struber, and Bessel. Uh, <coughs> and there was no, it was one quite true, there was no rivalry between them, and my great grandfather uh, conceded the victory to Bessel. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, I'd just like the, the name of that 
Um, I've got it in my I've got it in my text just a moment. The principal title is Unraveling Starlight, and uh, it has a subtitle. Unraveling star, Starlight, William and Margaret Huggins, and the Rise of the New Astronomy. And the author is Barbara Decker. I'm afraid I do not remember that. Thank you. Yes, how, uh, how would one select either, how would they select 61 Sydney or Vega? It, it, oh, it has to be a star of the show. That's an interesting question. Um, uh, originally, uh, before any distances were measured, people tended to assume that all stars were of the same intrinsic luminosity, and therefore the ones that look right are closer. Well, 61 Cygni, of course, is not a particularly uh, bright star. Um, but then, during the 18th century, when they began to measure the proper motions of stars, uh, then they recognized that the ones that appear to be moving uh, faster across the field of view were probably closer. Uh, and uh, 61 Cygni has a, a fairly large proper motion. That's why Bessel selected that. Uh, Struve selected Vega, partly because of the bright, but uh, also because he was influenced by a suggestion that Galileo had made, that uh, if you had a, uh, a bright star and a faint star uh, close together in the sky, the faint star was probably much further away. And so we have no measurable parallax. Whereas the bright one was close, and you could probably measure its parallax. And, and that's how Struve worked. He, he measured the uh, apparent changes in separation between a close companion of Vega and Vega itself. Uh, as far as Alpha Centauri goes, well, of course, that was, that's a bright star, as would happen to attract attention to. But I think Henderson simply had the measurements. And when he saw that Struber and, uh, and Bessel had succeeded, he thought, well, maybe I can make something of these. Sure. It would have taken them some years. It was uh, from year to year that they do the measurements? Oh, quite, yes. <coughs> you, you, need, uh, uh, you need at least 18 months to measure the paradox of the star. Um, at least uh, uh, in, in those days, you did. Uh, I'm not sure when Gaia went up and was able to make much more precise measurements. I'm not sure how many measurements they would take. But the idea would be, uh, in principle, what you have to do is you measure the apparent position of the star against the background stars at, at a given time. And six months later, you do it again. And so you've got the baseline uh, and the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Um, and then another uh, six months further away. And then you would, you would repeat your measurement again uh, uh, six, uh, six months after the second, uh, because there may have been some motion of the star. You have to make sure that you were really not measuring parallax. Uh, in practice, you would probably take two or three years in those days uh, to get good parallax measurements. And then they measure compared to. A group of stars, or is it just yeah. like a one yeah. star? Yeah, you measure it against the background of much fainter stars, which are assumed to be all distant. Mm -hmm. and, and statistically, that's all right. Uh, in individual cases, you've got that wrong, right? Uh, stars like Betelgeuse or Rigel uh, are, bright, uh, are bright in our sky because they are intrinsically remote. What sort of um, resolution were they getting with their telescopes? Sorry? What sort of resolution were they getting with the telescopes in position? Fraction of a second? Or? Uh, yeah, well, you're measuring, you're measuring, uh, you're measuring uh, changes of less than a second of arc. Yeah. Uh, but 
They work at price for all things, but the great refractor was nine and a half inches. Um, that's all due to heliometer, which I remember rightly was six inches. Um, of course, the, the clue was for having a good final micrometer uh, at the focal plane of the objective. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you again very much for coming and <laughs>